thought it'd be nice to have a conversation about my work and her work and the kind of things that we were dealing with in terms of both the studio practices. Uh, so I was hoping that maybe Althea could introduce her work first and I'll do a, a quick little blurb because clearly you can go upstairs for those who haven't seen the show. It's such a terrible show. Of the mayor's uh, so if you want to take it away, and then I'll do my thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to give a thank you also to, uh, thank you, no? like thank you for allowing us to have this conversation. Um, to Noel's point of being a, a person of color and being in a program in which you feel like you are eager to explore ideas that involve identity and race, and yet you're the only want to speak on behalf of everyone can be challenging and and um, to that point you know my uh, Noel was Noel was like the first graduate student I ever had really so uh, this was the my first position and um, I remember the day that I uh, I remember the day that I met you and um, and um, being in a way like shocked and surprised that like oh there's someone of color that's in this program that I get to work with. Um, so, you know, equally surprising for me as much as it um, may have been surprising you know, to you. So, uh, but anyway, thanks for having us so we can have this conversation and, um, and share. Um, so, this is going to begin with some of my most recent, uh, um, some of my most recent work. As I was already introduced, I'm, a, um, I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, currently been living there, and um, and I have um, for some time now um, been working in a variety of mediums, but specifically involving the subject surrounding hair, and um, and so I'll just kind of go through some of these first. I work in a variety of different methods. Uh, I do um, being that I do teach printmaking. Print is existent, largely existent in my work, the majority of my work, but I also look at sculpture um, and um, every most recently in photography. And so, um, so this is from a series that is um, entitled uh, Goody. Here's the second one. And um, so I've been doing a series of these where I am constructing and making these kind of wearable forms. And, um, and in fact, this work is a lot largely like some of the very, the very earlier work um, I, I did a long time ago when I made other wearable hats and stuff, which I'm not familiar with. So that's the most recently what I've been working with, and this is kind of this is also in line with some of the most recent um, work I've been doing. Um, so working in two dimension, working works on paper um, and hand printing. Um, and the subject of hair is something for some time now I've found in um, and being able to talk about um, the relationship of, or at least explore, the relationship of hair, um, color, texture, and its relationship to the body um, as a way of talking about social identity and exploring my own questions about um, both racial and feminine identity. And so, um, exploring for me personal um, struggles and questions that I had involving how I came to um, understand concepts of beauty and how I came to understand concepts of who I am in relationship to um, to that subject and my understanding of that subject. So this is a, this is a piece that is a uh, made out of hair clippings. Um, they're arranged on, on the floor, on this planning floor. Um, some sculptural uh, pieces, I tend to work in multiples like this. Um, so this is made out of synthetic hair. Um, and um, also some of the kind of like printed related collage work um, that I do, which I included, in fact, I included this image because I feel like it relates to Noel's show particularly. It does. Mm -hmm. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. so for some of you all have seen this, I'll just do it really fast. Uh, my interest uh, in imagery uh, stems from the misrepresentation of black people's media, which then validates a certain kind of uh, regulation of the black body. 
So if you always fear the black body, then it makes sense that the black body can be regulated by any means necessary. Uh, and I, I got there, frankly, by dealing with um, dealing with the law. You know, I, I haven't been arrested a number of times for fitting the description or been detained for fitting the description. I understood that there was a misrepresentation of myself in the world that, in a weird way, I'm consistently trying to fix. Uh, and it, it just so happens that, oops, sorry, that intersects my interest in black people's representation of themselves, of ourselves, right? So even in these publications like the Ebony magazines, they're not always positive images of black folks, right? So the, the image, the small image up top uh, next to the woman in the board, so that's, um, that's Cheney, last name Cheney, and that was during the, uh, the three men who were killed uh, at, what was that, Mississippi, which caused the Mississippi burning. But the image next to it, which is a mugshot, is of the brother of the man who was killed, right? So after he lost his older brother, his own image of self-worth was dissipated. Does that make sense to everybody? And my interest is in trying to look at those works and that idea of what does it mean, not just when there's an outside authority uh, trying to regulate or organize the body, but what happens when that psychologically gets absorbed into your own space, everybody did it. And how you put that back on yourself. So dealing with tough imagery and ideas like that, I tried to seduce the audience by material. I mean, damn, those tapestries upstairs are sexy. They're sexy, but they're hard to look at. I mean, if I could say anything about it, it'd be more like a, a joke. Dave Chappelle and Richard Pryor tell us things we'd rather not hear, but they tell us in humor. Everybody with me so far. So in the works and in my practice, I'm consistently <clears throat> grappling with what it means to be a black body, specifically a black male body, what it means to be regulated from without, and what it means to internalize that regulation so that you put it on yourself. Is everybody with me so far? Very good. So, when we were having this conversation on the phone about uh, about our own, you know, our own works, I figured, well, what, what came up? What were we thinking about? Well, so first we were thinking about what commonalities that mm -hmm. we both share in our own practice, okay. right? Our artistic practice, but it quickly led into some of the commonalities in um, in, in the topics that you're talking about right now. Self-representation, perception, um, and that reflecting that's happening. And so, um, well, how, well, so let's go there. Because there was a moment, so we had this great phone conversation, which we're going to let you into. Is everybody taking me so far? Mm -hmm. Good. We're, 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 we're talking to you for a little bit. Well, we're family because you know we had this conversation, and I I began to realize, but which actually uh, my manager and friend Monique and I had this conversation too, that. I'm gonna sound I'm gonna sound real stupid right now. I didn't realize I had focused on the black male body so much. I was just making it work. Uh -huh. And I didn't realize that I was generating uh, complex images that dealt with my own black subjectivity as a black man, but didn't realize I was just making things that were, I was interested in. Right? And, but there was, there was this moment when I was in grad school. She said something to me when I was in grad school and I really, it has stuck with me. I was making work like this when I was in Indiana. Um, they were all drawings and prints. And you said, why does everything have to be so dark? <laughs> and I, I didn't know how to deal with that. And I thought to myself later on, because I've always thought about it, I was like, but that's just my reality, uh -huh. right? As, as, as my, my little nephew used to say when he was five, but is it the true truth, Noel? Why would the truth be true? If it's just true, it's true. <laughs> And I asked, what do you mean? He, 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 he said later, when he got older, he said, is it your reality? And my true truth is that uh, I've had dark spaces uh, mm -hmm. because of my race and my gender. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to work out. Yeah, yeah. So back when I first, the work that Noel's referring to is some of this earlier work, but the material is also still really important. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Noel was working and drawing on tar paper and yeah, yeah. Um, and I still I still make reference to that actually. Um, uh, and uh, doing a lot of drawing, he's 
really good drawing. Oh. And <laughs> but a lot of portraiture are like work, right? So you know, and I think that naturally, I think you make a good point that not realizing that the subject um, was as directed or as specific as um, as you know, maybe as others see it, right? But that's, uh, but but, go ahead, I'm sorry. Isn't it always that? Yeah, go yeah, I don't know because even, it's, that's gonna sound bad. Because even when I went upstairs and we finally installed the show, <laughs> I remember looking at the wall and I was like, "See, there's a lot of strong stuff in here. I don't know if this is gonna be good. It's gonna overpower people or something." But then I had to remind myself. I thought, "This is my reality." Yeah, that's always been the work. Yeah, and I mean that's the reality of I think of any artist that's making though. That is common threads and. Twilight Barber refers to this DNA, creative DNA, that is just intertwined into who you are and your experiences. And it doesn't matter what stage in life you are, you will derive somehow back to or stay within those, you know, those interests, right? It's true. I, it is. I think uh, it, it's the interest. I think I'm lucky enough to be able to open myself to the process. Right? Because sometimes, you, you, like when I have students, and my students are like, but what is it going to be like when at the end? I said, I can't tell you that. You just have to go through it. <laughs> and going through it is the thing. And, and you can't be afraid of it. And, it's, and frankly, I think what has happened upstairs is some ultimate force has taken me in that direction. I have been lucky enough to open myself to following it. Does that make sense? So, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm thinking about how, because we're, we're talking about we're talking about the topic of identity. Mm -hmm. um, and how that concept of identity changes over time, you know, and how you respond to it or how you think of it, right? Um, and I might say, for me personally, it's become more inwardly reflective. So it might have started more as an exterior reflection, like looking out, looking outward, and trying to represent what I see out. And eventually, it's kind of turned inward, so it's interior for me. Uh, in what way? Hmm. How do you mean that? Um, that's more personal now. I think I, I'm, I, I'm allowing myself to respond to my own, um, my own uh, personal response, and and uh, without thinking I'm trying to res be the voice or the monolith for all other women, right. so to speak. Uh, but that's hard. Do you? It is. Sorry. It is hard. Are you part in general, right? Do you? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, let's let's go there. I feel like I mean, you know, I'm thinking about in your work and how that response to identity, I might say, for you, has shifted in the direction of like it's becoming more current, uh, more <laughs> you know, yeah. more current, more maybe more maybe even more direct in a way. Um, yeah, it's a little bit more deliberate. Um, I, like I say all the time, I cite, uh, I cite uh, my surrogate mother, Nia Simone. Mm -hmm. She she says, uh, you know, but she had, when she when they, when, they, when when her husband who was not a good person broke her, and she finally found that value, that strength of it, she said, I'm like, she said, I'm trying to go at it more coldly, more deliberately, you know, I'm trying to do that now, because frankly, I'm not quite sure how much how much time we have left in this space. I'm trying to do as much as I can while I'm here. Um, I just, you know, sometimes I just don't think, I just don't think uh, we have time for metaphor. Because sometimes metaphor takes too long to go through. And sometimes it just be nice to tell people, this is how I feel. You know, with, with a little nuance. <laughs> I don't want to beat you over the head or something. There's a little nuance. But then, but then how does that relate, how does that work with your work? Because, um, it is deliberate, but there's so much subtle nuance when you see them in person. Oh, I'm all the bus. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I am. I, I'm not, a, this is how our work is very different, right? I don't engage the, the figure specifically, right. right? Aspects of the body, but not specifically the figure. And, um, um, and yeah, and I, and I operate um, within metaphor, largely, because I see um, because as, I, as I've come to use it, hair is a symbol for many things. Hair is not hair. Um, hair is a symbol for um, 
for um, <coughs> definitions of of identity, right? Um, and it's a symbol of history, and it's a symbol of um, um, of um, assimilation. Um, so it's a symbol of culture, right? Yeah, but it seems to me in your work that it's specifically a rec representation of black feminine space. Right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right? What, what, what does that do, right? Because my my work uh, really deals with black masculinity as much as I try to say that it has some kind of relationship to black feminine space, which I have not worked out yet. Yours deliberately goes there, right? So is that is that autobiographical, or how do, how do we get there? Right. 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 Well, you know, I much like you, I I um, I found inspiration looking at. Uh, um, publications and printed media like the, the Ebony magazine, which you showed up here, right? And um, also old advertisements. I particularly found interest in those advertisements. You can still see them in the back of magazines. Mm -hmm. You know, those advertisements that like promise weird things mm -hmm. that seem unlikely, right? Which and you have to old. Um, yeah, and uh, that language is always um, interesting and inspiring because. It is um, it is commodifying the body, right? And so, um, and that's something that I you know, find interested in. Interested when you look at packaging, um, product packaging, um, and and then and and it has become personal in the way that I have. I'm looking at how I respond to that information, or how I respond um, to what I see. I recently did a been doing a series of works where I it started by going online and. Typing in in the Google machine, right? Typing in uh, perfect, right? And uh, typing in variations of that. So perfect hair, perfect this, perfect that. And seeing the images that were generated, right? And the similarity of those images generated. And, and realizing that a lot of those, the similarities of, the work, of those images generated, which were many of them were Eurocentric, right? Um, in terms of hair texture or skin color, that type of thing. Um, um, were also the things that I was fascinated by, right? Like, instinctively, right? Oh, mm, that's beautiful, right? It's a questioning, really. Um, and that's how it's turned more personal for me. It's, it's looking inward to um, more critically assess how and how much um, I have been influenced um, by, and my understanding has been um, shaped by, uh, Majority views, right? Rather than um, rather than um, uh, the rather than the minority, or, right? right. So, but what those things, yeah, but what those things have a tendency to do is, uh, as you say, they promise things, right, that we uncritically accept as gospel, right, 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 um, truths. Facts. Mm -hmm. Facts. Hashtag fact. This, no, it's true. And but, right. but, and, and, but it also does something that I think as an artist, I'm trying to do upstairs all, all the time and all the time I'm trying to do it. I'm trying to create uniqueness. And those those advertisements, as they sell a model, they homogenize everyone who buys into the model. Right? It right. doesn't it, 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 it takes away the counterculture and it re reduces everybody to one being. That's cool, right? Yeah, but it, but the thing is, we don't even realize it, right? Like, you know how many times I go to an art opening in New York and everybody's wearing chucks? The most uncomfortable shoes in the world. Like, <laughs> they, they have no staff, no support, they're, they're flat, they're, they're terrible, but everybody wears them. Everybody thinks they're cool and unique when they're wearing a pair of white ones. And I'm like, but but these, these shoes I'm wearing are comfortable. That's all that matters to me, you know? So there's a way in which these advertisements get in us. Yeah. And try to get us to unify ourselves, and it right. becomes a headline structure. Uh, but, but for me, I, I'm more interested in making work that I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Like I tell people, I want to go to the studio and be like, "Who made that?" Oh wait a minute, I'm in my own studio. I made that. <laughs> right? I want to make. I, I strive to come in every day to return to the studio and see something I've never seen before. Because if I've seen before, what's the point in doing it? I know it can be done, so let's do something else. Mm. Right? And that was, frankly, that's what struck me about when I first time I saw your work. Mm. I, had heard, I had never seen anyone use the print process this way. Mm. Like, she came in quiet. You know, she came in, hi, how are you? Oh, quiet comparison. You, you, you. Right, I'm loud. <laughs> I was in the studio blasting music. People talk about, oh, can you turn that down? 
no. Like, get out of my face. I was, I was not a very pleasant person at that time. Uh, <laughs> but she came in and she, what struck me was I had never seen anyone have such a facility and creativity with the media of photography. Because she was like doing these things with hair, and I was like, what? what? No, you really have. Because everybody at that time was doing a very traditional way of image making. And this method of image making broke me. You fucking broke me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to say something and it might get people teary eyed. I believe you tell people why you're here. There was a moment when I was in school, it was, it was my second year, and we were at the Litho Press. We were yeah. at the press trying to make a print, and nothing was working. Yeah. You know. I was I, I was depleted. I started to cry. Like a little, like a little baby or something. Mm -hmm. And this very polite mm -hmm. uh, woman approached me and said, What's wrong? I said, Nothing <laughs> working, man. And then I may have snot bowl or something. I'm like, it's not working. And she was like, put it down. You're okay. And I said, What? She said, put it down. Go home and watch it. And I was like, what is she talking about? This has to be done. It's due next week. And she was like, go home and watch it. We'll come back in a few days. We'll see what happens. I went home. I took a break. I'm not sure if I watched the movie. I don't know. It was so <laughs> I came back in a few days, and it all made sense. And it worked out better. It did. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there were just so many ways in which my first interaction with you got me this far. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that. And, but, you know, Mel, you've always, to your credit, you've always, um, you've always pushed a little bit out of the edges, right? You've always worked large scale, and in the press, of it, it was too small for you, oh, right? Yeah, it was like too that. small of a space uh, for you. I remember us laboring over trying to print something that was six feet long, you know, oh, on a yes. litho press. And if you if you've done printing, you know that everything is designed to be to fit within the parameters of the bed, right? Of the press bed, of that surface, right? Mm -hmm. And so we were the, just trying to break that a little bit, kind of like figure out how to like read it, you know. Oh. Um, but you know, but to that point. But, yeah. work. but there but there are similarities in the work, right? Like even if if we go upstairs and we look at uh man, oh, yeah. if we look at some of the energy works, right, that, that really consider the ways in which advertisements play or insinuate or poke black beauty and black aesthetics. I'm into that, right? Uh, for me, I'm really curious about why the the black-owned publications yeah. would reproduce or promote certain ways of being that may not always be possible, mm -hmm. right? Just like saying, and even in some of the terminology, right? Like some of the terminology is like. Uh, they have these images that are like side by side comparisons. You have an image of a black woman before she blackens her skin, and you have an image of a black woman after she blackens her skin. And she's much happier after her skin is than mine. Right? Yes. And as a boy, I remember looking at these in a magazine and like, okay, that must be it. And they have the word natural, mm -hmm. right? Under the light certain thing. And when you're young, you assume that this is the way it is. Yes. And then when you get older, you start to you start to see this colorism. Right? You, I never thought about that when I was a boy. Right? And there was, my mother now says, don't ever say good and bad hair, just say hair. You know, when I was growing up, what was that joke? You got Andy in your band, I got good hair or something like that. Mm -hmm. you know? right. right, I didn't have good hair. My hair was hard to tame, so my father used to cut it off every two weeks in the basement. Well, I mean, some of those habits. He would he would cut me bald every two weeks, and he would say, all right, go to school, and I'd get smacked in the back of the head by everybody going to the ball. <laughs> Because I didn't have time to take care of the hair, and your hair had to be managed. Well, it was practical, I guess, but my head was hurt. You didn't smack it. No, it's quite alright. I'm trying to remember what. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm forgetting that. That's okay. That's okay. I love these compositions. I'm forgetting. So let me let me ask this because I'm I'm curious. Oh, I don't know what to say. Yeah. Oh no, go ahead. Because there's something I want to get to about. Representation of the black body. Yeah, well, and that's what I think we should. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think we should head in that direction. Oh, I was just going to mention that the advertisement that one of those a lot of those advertisements that you're talking about um, were promoted by um, Madam C. B. Walker's 
and right condiment. So this is you know something that was not in there, selling her products of um, African American women, and um, and those were produced because they were what we understood, right? They were what we had been taught, and um, in terms of what was acceptable and what will sell, right? So yeah. again, the commodity, right? So but yeah, let's talk about um, let's talk more about where are you going? I want to go into the black figure. Oh, yes. Yeah. I want to go into because we were having a spirited conversation on the phone. Mm -hmm. Does uh, it get deep? It's deep and it's troubling, right? But I, we, I, we asked this question why is it that black figuration, by which I mean paintings of black bodies, seems to be more acceptable than a painting where the black body is suggested, not present at all, or fully abstract? Yes. Right? But no, but yeah. Not figurative, non figurative. I would, but I would argue that maybe your work is figurative in a way mm -hmm. that's, that's not like correct. Right. 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 Uh, so we were talking about that, and I was trying to figure out, well, why is it that black bodies sell? Yeah. They do, don't they? Yeah, and recently, I mean, and it's not just recently, it's the question of, like, this. there's this other underlying tradition in the art mainstream, right? Oh. To uh, the tradition being of the this, the look, as you're talking about, right? The look and the subject matter of um, art of successful black artists, right? Yes, that's where I was. Right. Um, um, yeah. Which, there's a lot of ways to approach this. So there's a lot of ways to talk about this. Um, I'm, I'm, I was thinking back to and um, thinking about your show when I first saw it. And, um, um, thinking of Terry James Marshall's work, and um, he had an exhibit um, called The Black Romantic, and that was largely intended to be an exhibit about uh, how particular types of work are being, um, uh, particular types of painting is being recognized um, that is done by, that is um, labeled as black artists, right, paintings. And, um, what does he say, right? Uh -huh. would, it, would it be something like the paintings of black figures are more acceptable? Um, no, um, I think, uh, well, I mean, I think um, largely what he was intending it to be about was that there was, a, yes, that there was a more acceptable form of or um, more recognized form of um, um, representat representation of the black body right. in pain. Right. Well, I, don't, I, I, tend, I, I seem to tend towards the black body because, um, well, first of all, it's noble. You know, for, for the subject matter that I'm trying to deal with, I kind of have to have that body in, in the room. Right. right. There, there are standards. There are moments when I stand at work, I look at the work and I think, well, that is me. Right, like it, in in uh, in, in Die Lightning, the larger uh, black and white black figure on the far right staring out, the one who engages the audience, I do I do see that as me, you know, because it takes one person to look out and be critical to, to make those decisions, you know. I I almost think in a way, yeah, it's tough to look at. Uh, I almost think in a way. Um, That he is he is the potential for dissent. Because there are multiple ways in which this this, this figure is dissenting. He's first of all he's staring out. You know, he's he's engaging the audience with the rest of the crowd, when the rest are not doing that. Um, secondly, he seems to be disobeying the order. The order to me seems to be face this way against the wall, which I have heard plenty of times before. He is not doing that. That reminds me very much of when, you know, Mane makes the painting of Olympia and all of a sudden the female is engaged with the audience and then that breaks the whole mold. So for me, I really do, I do see myself in a lot of work, even with the works of like uh, Michael Brown, uh, I see myself in that, you know, because there are moments when I think, had I chose one, five percent to go the other direction, I wouldn't be here, right? If I, if I had a back top that cop, when he, when he has a gun out, I wouldn't be here. 
Um, you know, sit for, I love it. Sit for today. Say if I had, if I had gone one, if I had gone five percent the other way, I wouldn't be sitting for today. You know, um, so I see myself in the work, um, which makes it hard to deal with. Well, my, and it makes it hard to understand. Also, in the, in the question that you were originally asking about why is it that what is it about the black body, right? Like, what is it about the topic of maybe, not just racial identity, it's that figure, right? Um, <coughs> well, okay, okay, okay. people find so interesting, right? And yeah, like right. You, it, but it's, it's a, okay, so it is a desire for that body that goes both ways. It's not just a uh, white audience desire for it. Black folks desire that black body too, right? Uh, there was a there was a moment when I was uh, at the uh, Dorset in mm -hmm. Paris for the, the black the black model show, yeah. um, and I think I might have been the only person of color in that room in those rooms. And some of those paintings and objects were tough to deal with. I mean, I was flat. And then there was a moment when I was in that space, and I was like, "How dare these people stare at these works?" Like I had ownership over those objects, right? Yes. And then I had to realize. But I'm desiring these bodies too. Because I've been mesmerized by these paintings. There's that painting, I don't remember who did it, but there's a painting of a slave woman. And there's a naked male figure on the ground, tied to the ground by stakes. And he's being beat, beaten while there are fig figures, uh, slave, other slaves around while there's other figures beating him. And I remember standing back, it's a, it's a really big painting, I remember standing back and watching the white audience desire that thing and being frustrated. And they realize, not only do I desire the, the, the figure, mm -hmm. I desire this response from the audience. That's complex. And the desire is birthed from your ownership of it. Also. Or my right. thought, my of oh, oh, what? Of the body or the, of the work, right? Both. But see, that's the complexity, right? I, I don't know if I own that, right? It's like, I don't know, it's like, um, It's like when I see black folks do things really well and someone else criticizes them, I get mad about it. I'm like, but why am I really, am I mad? Because they're criticizing someone who is black and by the way, I think they're criticizing me. Right? So then there's that. But I, there's a moment when I was on that show, I was like, but I don't own any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm stuck on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with that. And <coughs> It's a tough place to be in. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a tough place to be in um, in the act of representing one, representing yourself, and in doing so, also representing <laughs> speaking politically. So, representing um, not just yourself, but representing oh, a political body, or a political body, or a group of people. Mm -hmm. Right. But so, for instance, the obligation or do you, do you, and do you get that? Do you, do you get that, that? that like sense of guilt or obligation um, to the to the stuff you you know as a black artist, a black artist must speak about culturally relevant, socially relevant topics, yeah. and um, and if they're not doing so, then they are they're not present. They're not woke. Well, you know, I used to think that, right. you know, but if but if they go through their life every day dealing with it in the way they deal with it, you know, because uh, there are other artists I know who, are, who make abstractions, and their response to me would be something like, "But I'm black. I live it every day. Why do I have to deal with it at work?" Mm -hmm. Dig. And I, at one time I was like, "But that's that's a cop out, man." But then I thought I was like, "But it's not every, everybody doesn't see it as their responsibility to do these things." I just I just personally feel it's my responsibility. Or at least somebody sent me on this, on this planet to make these kind of this this way of speaking known. Right. Well, you know, you have people on both sides of the argument, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I think it puts it. I think it puts the the person of color, and I'll speak broadly, the person of color that's the artist. It puts them in a uncomfortable, unfair position to make decision to make that decision, right, and to be judged regardless of how you fall. Um, on the other side of it. Yeah. But, and I also would say I do feel a responsibility, but also uh, 
of the paradox of re reproducing the pain. Because mm -hmm. it was, you know, in my work, when you, if you take the black body and you reproduce uh, the anguish, you and your, and while you're trying to have this conversation, you and yourself are complicit in reproducing the pain. I am my own oppressor. Um, so when I come to the studio, I, I have to be in the studio, I can be at home or something. I, I consistently think about, about that, I'm like, should I be doing it this way? Isn't it, isn't it bad if I put the image back out there? Aren't I just feeding this, the structure in the way that the structure wishes to be fed? But then I thought, but if you don't present the image, how are people going to know it exists? You did like if you don't if you don't speak up the speak up that truth, how do you know? Like, you know, like, if, like you're married, if you're married to something, and your partner, your, your wife or husband or a partner are mad at you, how are you going to know what you did wrong if they just stop talking to you? You know, so I figure that communication has to be there. Uh -huh. Yeah. But I do struggle with it a lot. Yeah, yeah. A lot. A lot. And and there's and it's it's layered, right? Because you're saying you're looking at your work and you see yourself, and then you're also so there's a form of copying happening there, mm -hmm. um, and then the appropriation that's happening in the, amongst from the work, from the media, right? Like whatever fits media to your taking it and um, recreating it and appropriating it, right? And then again, you know, we have another appropriate, another copy here, right? All right. But um, yeah, but that's, that gets me to thinking about, like, I never thought about, which is going to be weird, because I never really thought about how I appropriate things. Mm. Okay. I just, I just felt like... You are so Prince-centric. Uh, yeah. You are so, you are. I love yeah, Prince, I just don't make a lot of them. Which is weird, I teach it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it was up. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I never really considered appropriation, because, you know, I took, can I tell you a story? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> you know, when I was a boy, and my father was a civil engineer, so he would he he had retired from the government and opened his own firm, and the government would hire him to essentially fix government housing. And during the summers, instead of putting us in camp, he would drive like, my brother and I to the to the sites and be like four hour rides. And to keep us entertained, he used to buy these uh, these traits, these books on learning how to draw cartoon characters. You draw three lines, and that would be Fred Flintstone's nose. And then you drive, draw four or five more lines, and you have his head. And then yada yada yada, right? Um, and he would give us tracing paper and carpet paper. This is how old he was. And I learned how to draw by tracing Fred, Fred Flintstone's head on Scooby Doo's body, and then maybe erasing the foot and putting uh, Barney's foot on or something like that. So from the jump, I had probably been appropriate, never even thought about it. Every, every, my father gave me the tools of appropriation. He was like, take this straight to paper and this card of paper and make it work. <laughs> and he also had, because his, his firm was basically in the basement of the house, he had a copy machine in the house. Big, big something that he did. And he would say, go, go, go play with the copy machine. And, he, <laughs> and this, actually, this actually makes sense now that I'm thinking about it in terms of the way my images work here with the go, 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 go. When you're five and you have a copy machine, you learn real fast that if you do this with the with the with the paper on the copy machine, it, it distorts the image. I, I was doing that too. Mm -hmm. Oh shit! It's <laughs> <laughs> like therapy. Huh? It's all coming out now. Oh. And then we would have oh yeah, now I'm now. Sorry, but how do you deal with appropriation? Oh yeah. Well, let's see. Let's click. Um, oh, I love that direction. Yeah. I want to I talk to you about that too. I'm sure we'll get back to that. But um, <clears throat> I want to talk about appropriation in, um, well, it's, it's pretty much in most of what I do. But um, um, I want to talk about how I found significance um, in the metaphor of it. Right? Um, so, so my um, my works on paper, this this stuff here, right? These are um, these are printed, and the intention, and I'm printing from the actual from actual hair material, right? And so I using a process, this is a print process. I'm able to, in essence, make a copy of the actual of the hair itself 
to generate a print so that the print looks nearly identical to the material that it came from. It's the same in size, it's the same, um, it, it captures all the same texture. Um, and so through this process of taking the real thing and then making a copy of it, and then generating a copy and printing a copy so that it nearly looks identical to the real thing, I am, um, I'm using the method to create deception, right? Like I want people to look at the work and to think upon a quick glance that that's actually the material there, right? Or is that actually, can I touch it? Um, as Because I think touch is so important and intrinsic to how we understand. Um, it's a natural instinctual reaction. Uh, so, like, um, so the goal here is to create that sense of fact and fiction, that confusion. Um, it's a form of distortion too, right? And um, so that relationship between is is it and what am I seeing here? Am I seeing the real thing or a false, um, false thing? And and I use anyway, and I use synthetic hair for a lot of the work really because it also is tied to that as well. And so so that is printed in that way too. Let's go back this way. Those are all printed in that way. Uh, these here I'm using a stencil, right? And so I'm using a stencil to create again another copy, um, but using the material at the material that creates the image is discarded, right? So it's it's something that's material, these like hair clippings or things that would be thrown away, right? So then reusing them, using um, using the method of copying to recreate them to see them with new eyes, right? To see them as something that is tangible. Um, that has a sense of structure and beauty to it, inherent to it. And so, um, and I just use lace, like I use Victorian lace, right, to sift this, to sift this hair through. So I find a lot of significance in the method of the making, which I think you do too. Yeah, for me, it's, it's the, the method is important, but iteration, iteration is important. So what does it mean to take an image and put it through different Mode, image mode, right? What's the, is the upstairs, right? We have uh, we have three, four four papers, blue papers that were handmade, and one of the images uh, it's the bottom right one. Uh, if you look across uh, the gallery in the same gallery, there's five of that same image woven multiple times, right? Right. So first of all, I'm interested in what happens when the image goes through a series of different modes, and what does that do to the meaning? That image as a half tone on paper is not the same when it's woven, right? And then I was trying to come, trying to figure out beyond just the appropriation of the first, uh, the, the original image, which came from uh, Ebony Magazine. What happens when you take a, a process like weaving that is supposed to be so singular, right? People make one weaving and they make it forever. What happens when you speed the process up so you can make multiples, so that the weaving now becomes a print, right? So I'm trying to think of that stuff by way of iteration and appropriation too. And when I think about that, I think of there's also the, the dialogue there goes to what's original, right? Mm -hmm. Originality. So the singular becomes, has more value in its, in its originality, right? right? right. Um, versus the reproduced. Yeah, I think it's, it's, yeah, I think it seems to me that uh, because, because of how the image is, this idea of using the weaving as a, as a relationship to screen culture, uh, and distortion. I thought, well, if all the images that we receive uh, through TV are distortions, but we base ourselves off of those, by which I mean those are our ground, then our ground is problematic, right? So when you look at the work that's upstairs, I am physically trying to rip through the ground. Right. I'm trying to find the thing that's beneath the thing that we think is the ground. Does that make sense to everybody? Because uh, the, the origin is much deeper than the thing that we think. The, the rivers are deep, the steel waters are deep. Oh, I like that, man. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm trying to get to that level with, with the thinking. Mm -hmm. So that we, we, appropriation is good, metaphors are good, and I want to go deeper than that. Mm -hmm. I want to I I I find the original black mother. Yeah, that's what I want to find. Sorry. Yeah, it's not working. I'm trying. I mean, I haven't, I haven't figured that out yet. I, I will say this. You know, I, I don't only just make weavings. I also write critically. Uh, and that idea of trying to find the thing that's beneath the thing was was published in an essay for a journal called Eflux, 
And it was me trying to look at David Hammonds, the brilliant artist David Hammonds, as the, the, the figure, which is the mole that is beneath the ground. I'm trying to be like that. I want to be beneath the ground. Because if the thing you see is this floor again, and you think this is the bottom, no, I'm going to be the person under. I'm going to be Ellison to this little man. I want to shake, I want to shake the goddamn structure so bad. I really do, but I don't want you to see me do it. Now that I'm telling you what I'm doing, I'm probably out of myself. This <laughs> but yeah, there, there's just a lot of stuff that, yeah. that we share in terms of ideas. And I appreciate, I really have always appreciated the work because the first time I saw it, I was deceived. Huh. Oh, you wanted to deceive me, girl. I did, I wanted to deceive It worked, because when I first saw it, I was like, is this real hair? But, I was like, but, it's, but it's on a sheet of paper, and I remember you didn't see. I remember when you were away, I tried to touch it, I was like, I tried to rub the thing, like, and I was like, oh, I'm like the bird flying into the, the, the painting of the olives or the grapes or something. This is bizarre, but I really appreciate that. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, but let me, let me circle back. We don't, should we stop now? Can I say one more thing? I'm just curious. There's, there's, there's just one, there's just. I didn't get it. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. You're talking. I'm, I'm the time for you, man. I'm the Rolex. Um, for those folks who are here from university and who are making paintings and making work, keep it up. Uh, you are the future. Without you, I won't make it. I need you to make it. I need, and this is, you know, this is real work, you have a duty, I'm sorry. I need you to get those higher degrees so you can be in the boardrooms with us, so you can make real change. You dig? That's your job. 